set of nine videotapes provides an opportunity to share in a unique experience where Stafford Beer introduces an audience to the world of managerial cybernetics. The event took place over five days in July 1994 at the Falkendale Hotel near Lampeter in Mid Wales. It was organised by the Liverpool Business School at John Moores University, where Stafford is Honorary Professor in Organisational Transformation and a Senior Fellow. The aim was to provide a video learning resource by recording discussions between Stafford and an audience that had little or no previous knowledge of the subject. Over the course of the event, Stafford explains the development of the subject from the initial scientific discovery of cybernetics. Through his own development of managerial cybernetics, he introduces the tools and models that he has created to offer an alternative approach to conventional management practice. The resulting material embraces the key principles and models that have previously been introduced in his 13 books and referred to in many of his published papers. This is the first learning resource where all these have been brought together in one integrated way. Managerial cybernetics continues to be the only available scientific and coherent account of effective managerial practice. Stafford provides numerous anecdotes, applications and insights from the perspective of practitioner, manager and scientist. Session 2 continues the story of the development of cybernetics, introducing the key English characters of the 1950s and 1960s when Stafford himself became a key player. It provides a vivid account of what innovative scientists are really like. The picture is balanced by accounts of the invention and parallel development of computers and a personal criticism of their deployment in managing social affairs. The concept of system is introduced. The limitations of linear thinking and causality is contrasted with systemic thinking. Illustrations include railways, transport and wider social systems. Stafford urges us to train ourselves to look at the total relevant system. He advocates that we move into a situation and look at what is happening. This is backed up by a personal statement. Or my successful consulting has been to do with things that the person asking me the question has not even considered because they are reverberations of this complex system. In other words, we need to look at things in a completely different way. The session finishes with a number of key questions. What is the relevant system? Can regulation be achieved? How can we measure a system? I, I tried to tell you that I wanted to get you excited and join in the feeling of all this. And you've hit another historic moment by a complete accident, because since I saw you, which is only half an hour or whatever, I have received by a special messenger a copy of my new book. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, shall, uh, I shall talk to you about the contents of this book later in the week when we get there. But uh, I was just thumbing through it, and I couldn't help thinking how apposite the 
the start of the preface of this book is, and I thought I'd just read you this, these couple of sentences. I'm getting my eye in place. Uh, yes. This book is new in every sense, although it is issued under the usual generic heading of my books, The, manage the Managerial Cybernetics of Organization. Why do I persist in using a word that has finally penetrated the wall of public unknowing in the grotesque shapes of cybermen and cyborgs? Mm -hmm. And whose original and inspirational meaning wanders like a lost shade through the groves of an uncomprehending academe. It is because a reductionist world, we looked at that, badly needs its holistic message as science of the regulation of large complex probabilistic systems actually exists that is interdisciplinary in approach and consequently inclusive in its world view and i thought that that really did follow what we were saying rather neatly <laughs> so historic moment as i say i haven't held that in my hands before yeah. I'm just reviewing uh, what I've said, and um, uh, m apart from Ashby, all the emphasis was on what happened in uh, the United States. And I thought I'd just mention what was going on elsewhere. Um, a lot was happening in England, and it centered, to some extent, on the invention of the computer. Now, if, if we're going to talk about regulation, and obviously the computer's in there somewhere, isn't it? And I think in all the wrong places. It, I think this machine has been grossly misinterpreted, mishandled, wrongly used, and what is far worse, it hasn't been used for any of the things that it could actually do. Uh, well, that is. So we shall be poking away at that as we go on. I don't want to, to devote special... Uh, a special program, as it were, to, to computers, but let's get it in on the act. Who would like to suggest when, when computers first came up? Where do you see it? Babbage is the first mechanical, isn't it? Right. Babbage. Wartime? Wartime? Hmm? Program machine, placemaking. Lace making, the Jacquard loom. You, you're a French scholar. It, it was a French. Uh, the Jacquard loom. When was that? To the oh, it's a hell of a long time ago. Yes, 18th century. I'm pretty sure. You know what? The, what we're talking about is a loom with punched holes in, in it. It was exactly like the first computers with punched cards, um, like the Hollerith machine, as was and so on. And it, it made uh, made very complicated fabrics. It's a marvelous invention, way ahead of its time, and that was responsible, of course, for all the uh, revolts under the name of Luddites. You know, people um, opposed to this kind of development. Well, let's try another one. Who? Somebody else said. Oh, you said Babbage, and you said the war. <laughs> so that was fast. It's about a hundred years ago. <laughs> yes, Babbage was a very extraordinary man who tried to build a steam computer, literally, you know. <laughs> it was a huge steam engine there. And it was all mechanical. It turned these huge gear wheels. I'm actually, I've actually worked for Babbage machine, which is in the uh, Science Museum. And I was lying on the floor, uh, trying to look up inside the glass case, and the curator fell over my legs. Uh, he was running, and he came a hell of a cropper, and he was very embarrassed. And the result of that was that he, uh, he very kindly took the glass case off, and I'm one of the few people who actually pulled the lever and see what, see what happens. So that was, uh, that was mechanical. Then Leibniz, I mentioned earlier, uh, was a... German philosopher who very clearly saw that something like this could be done and a number of he invented a calculating machine of, which had the carrying capacity and so on you see to you know, carry numbers and so forth 
And obviously some of this was adaptable, but the, the modern computer it was, it was clearly the invention of a man who most people have never heard of, whose name was Alan Turing. Ever heard of him? The Turing machine, you should have done. And I think uh, his paper on the Entscheidung's problem was, is either 1933 or 36, I can't remember. But he tried to, uh, he was a mathematician, and he tried to solve a problem in theoretical logic uh, called the Entscheidung's problem. And I won't go into that, for goodness sake, but in an appendix in this paper to the London Mathematical Society, uh, he put forward the design of a universal uh, computing engine, as he called it. And it was, it was exactly the specification for what you need. You need a, an input, and you need to inspect it, and you need to be able to change the last symbol under a certain set of rules. And he had the whole thing there in the, in the 30s. And this was followed up, and a lot of people think that um, the Americans ran the first computer, and they didn't. The first computer was run in Manchester. Pardon? Uh, lion's cakes were close, <laughs> believe it or not, were close behind, yes. The so-called Leo machine, which was the office machine. And um, the, the first machine was run in Manchester University, and it beat the Americans to it, because the, the American machine was, didn't, didn't have storage. It, it was a very complicated means of computing, but it didn't have a stored program. It had stored memory, but not stored program. So, uh, England was, uh, was very prominent in this. And at the time, you see, I'm going back now to, uh, to the early 50s. We got through the 40s by hook or by crook this morning. And I, I had the feeling you were, always, you were all thinking, when, do, when does he mention the Flintstones, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the, the 50s is a little more respectable. Um, and I was in Sheffield, as I mentioned, and the centre of cybernetic activity in England was for some godforsaken reason in Bristol. Now, Ashby was uh, running the Burton Neurological Institute, as I told you, in Bristol. In, um, nearby was, was Gray Walter. Has anybody heard of him? He was the man who invented a mechanical tortoise. And... Uh, uh, yes, well, you see, most, what I'm trying to give you the flavour of is it's investigating a new area. How, did, how do you proceed, you see? Well, you've got a computer here, which is very ungainly and does certain things in a rather predictable way. And then you start thinking about the biological world, and you say, well, not really like a computer, is it, you see? Well, then you start wondering why it is and why it isn't, and you start trying to evaluate this. Meanwhile, of course, the popular press is going mad, talking about thinking machines and digital, hyping it all up and making scientific advance rather difficult, frankly. I, I had 14 reporters camping on the lawn of my house at one stage, and I was panic stricken. It's very alarming to be assaulted by the, the media. This was in, in, the, in the 50s. So, let me tell you, just give you the flavour of, of uh, Gray Walter's uh, uh, thing. He was the president of the uh, Electroencephalography Institute of the World. He was, he was the most famous of the, uh, the people who invented the EEG. You know, you put these things on, you get the brain waves out. And uh, a very extraordinary man. Uh, he wrote an, a science fiction novel, he did a lot of funny things. Well, he particularly invented a t what was popularly called the, the tortoise, but was he called, being a scholar, Machina Speculatrix. <laughs> and I can't resist telling you what this was like. I played with this thing. Um, you imagine a little uh, thing like this, uh, looking like a, a Ouija board with three wheels. So you've got two wheels at the back which drive the thing with a little uh, electric motor and one wheel in the front which swivels round and round and round so the thing would go mad if you just let it loose because it would just go mad. And on top of the uh, front wheel is our famous photocell again, you see. 
So this thing now has an eye with, with one input. You know, either this photocell is firing or it isn't. So it's like a periscope. Now this means that if you shine a light at this thing, it will follow you. And you see, the, the issue that was facing people who were interested in brains and very complex systems was how they were built up. Now this isn't the same as reductionism because you are saying, how could you possibly get this kind of behavior? And so here we have this, this tortoise with, with the eye and it's following the light. And that's, that's kind of weird, you know. When we first saw this, people thought this was very odd. And then people, of course, cashed in and made toys like that. And they made, uh, I, I remember getting the whole board of United Seal on their hands and knees in the boardroom trying to chase a, a bug that I was working with an ultrasonic whistle in my pocket and they didn't know how I was doing it. <laughs> people are ch children at heart, thank God. Now, the problem now, you see, I, I want to try and show you how the methodology of science works in practice if you abandon the, the reductionist model. We, we, we're following, we're, we're getting this tortoise to follow us, you with me? And now it hits, it hits the table. So what's it going to do? It can't do anything, it's stopped. Now how do you deal with that? Now, I mentioned oscillators to you before. What you do about that is, uh, you turn the photocell into an oscillator. Now, easily done, you put a shell over this machine, that's why it was called a tortoise, because damn will look like a tortoise, it's, it's a shell over the top, on a single screw, pivot. Now, now, it's following the light with its periscope, and it hits something, and it short circuits the shell against the chassis, turns the photocell into an oscillator, the result is that the, the engine starts reversing and going forward and it feels its way around the obstruction. So you, you, you lead it into the furniture deliberately and goes <laughs> like this and comes after you again. Now, with only two cells, we've got very biological looking machine on our hands. I mean, it's just extraordinary, really. Now, Grey Walter put this thing into the South Bank exhibition in, when was that, 1952, 1950, 1952, oh God, yes, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> um, after the war there was a thing called the South Bank e exhibition which was kind of modelled on the Crystal Palace exhibition of the 1800s uh, to, to hype things up for Britain a bit after the, after the war. And this was a star attraction. Now, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? It's such a simple little thing. It's so out of keeping with what we think of as machines. This is what I'm trying to stir up in your minds. So, here is Grey Walter, and he has several of these things running about his living room. So, he is lying on the floor, as a good scientist, with a notebook, observing their behaviour. Can you believe it? With a stopwatch trying to find out what the result of interacting these quite small components is going to be. One of these things stopped. Noted. Stopped. So here's Gray looking at this machine, wondering when it's going to do something in, in, the, in the context of what the other ones are doing. Nothing happens. It's broken. <laughs> <laughs> so, doesn't our friend Gray feel a complete bloody idiot? <laughs> I mean, he's dying there for 20 minutes, nothing happens. So he said, well, we can't have this. So he put a light, um, an ordinary torch bulb, a low circuit thing on a battery inside the, the shell, which, which tested the circuit so that if the machine was still active when it stopped, then the light came on. So no more lying on the floor looking at a dead machine, you see. Now, what happens? Think this one through, my friends. <laughs> Here are two machines wandering about, you see. They hit each other. So they retreat. At the moment they're still, both their lights come on. Therefore the two photo cells, see? What? Exactly. 
this is a courting dance. <laughs> this, this is a, any decent biologist would tell you that these things were about to mate. They just go round in circles like this. <laughs> Isn't it lovely? <laughs> and then the, to, to conclude that story, the uh, I, uh, I, <laughs> oh, I wish I could tell you that now. So um, uh, Gray's house was uh, was painted white. He, he had a fascination with this. He, all his wives were, were, were Finnish. They were all this weird kind of blonde. And um, the, uh, the, the skirting boards, you know, they, they were that deep. They were like that one. They're deep and white gloss paint. Now, you see, one of these guys comes along, hits that, withdraws a bit, the light comes on, sees the light in the... <laughs> oh, 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 what a lovely boy then. <laughs> You've got narcissism <laughs> coming out of this simple little machine. Now, all of us were building these. Uh, I mean, I've given you the most dramatic. My machines were a bit more complex. I, I built computers out of ponds by, by dipping stuff into, into a soup of primeval slime and so on. Gordon Pask, who I really should mention, uh, uh, he was also messing about with this. He and I were very close friends. We're the same age, the same generation. So I used to go down from Sheffield to see Grey Walter and Ross Ashby and another man whose name is Frank George, who's written a number of books on cybernetics, who was a, a lecturer in psychology in the University of Bristol. So it was a pretty, pretty good visit, you know, to do all that come down from Sheffield, see these people. And then I would come back through Cambridge and look at Edzac, which was the, the computer they were building there, through Teddington, uh, which was the National Physical Laboratory, which was, um, oh, what was it? I forgot what it was called now. Ace, Ace and then Juice with the machines there. Uh, Edzac, I've mentioned. Mark One Star was was Manchester, which became the first one that actually worked. And these were all digital machines. And in uh, Farnborough, in the Royal Aircraft es Establishment, they had an analog machine which filled three semi-detached houses, and was so complicated that <laughs> the last time I went there, I remember very distinctly, they admitted that there wasn't anybody who knew how it all worked, <laughs> Bec be because people knew about bits of it and nobody understood the whole thing any longer. And there's an awful lot of lessons in all this, and it's immensely fun. And that's really the, the key to my opening with you, is to try and get across this idea of fun. Few of you have a background in science. And the popular image of a scientist is a chap in a white coat with a row of biros and no sense of humor is a really a bore. I mean, so real scientists aren't like that at all, I assure you. <laughs> the other place where uh, quite a lot was happening at that time, most peculiarly, I think, was France. Why do I say peculiar? Because um, Descartes, heard of Descartes? The Cartesian philosophy dominated French culture absolutely and was the ultimately reductionist thing and the French have been hugely conditioned by this uh, this reduction approach so it was quite odd that there was a huge outburst of cybernetics I suppose on behalf of people who, who realized that Descartes was a bit of a trap this is the I think, therefore, I am chap, you know, cogito ergo sum. I'm pink, therefore, I'm spam. <laughs> there, there's more jokes about that than I've had hot dinners. So, um, Cuffignol, Gilbo, Pierre de la Tille, the three men I very distinctly remember straight away, they're all dead now, were really active in France, doing the same sort of thing. And that seemed to die on the vine. I only know one uh, one person in France now who understands any of this, and he's a mathematician. So, 
Uh, I was really trying to dispose of history in the first session, and this is sort of leftovers. But I, I wanted to give you as balanced a picture as I could of what was happening at that time. Now, the next thing, of course, is what is this all about, and what can you do about it when all the fun and games is over? Well, not over, I hope, but uh, suspended, and we start trying to think seriously about what to do. Well, now, um, in science, the first thing is to, to try and recognize what you're dealing with, and then to try and measure it. Now, what are we dealing with here? The word system leaps to mind as soon as you start thinking about regulation. We're talking about some kind of system. Now, just as the word control is a bit of a no-no for the reasons we looked at earlier, you see, various words get into the vocabulary uh, and are seized on. Now, when I wrote my second book in the early 60s, Everything was scientific. This was the catchword. And, and I made a big thing in that book about complaining about scientific toothpaste. I mean, what the hell was that supposed to mean? It, 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 I mean, of course it's scientific. <laughs> you, you, don't put, you don't put cyanide in toothpaste. To that extent, it's scientific. But it's the catchword. Now, system is now a catchword. Uh, I saw an advertisement of a beautiful young woman doing things to her legs in Canada just before I left here. And up on the stream comes... the Remington shaving system. Mm -hmm. Now, I used to call this a razor. <laughs> hey, what the devil are they talking about? Shaving system? See, so words get terribly devalued and it's an awful pity, but it's real life. So it behoves us, if we're serious, to, to thinking about all these matters, and I, I assume we are. You know, what actually do we mean by a system? And, and it, especially, how would you measure it? Now, there's social comment here. What do we measure normally? Hmm? Somebody. We look at social systems. What is it we measure? <laughs> it's a very special type of social system. <laughs> well, go on. Yeah. How how do we how do we measure it? Statistics of what kind? Okay. Mm -hmm. But what what is the unit of measurement? Pardon? Absolutely. The unit of measurement is the buck, the, the pound, the quid, the franc, the Deutschmark. Because our culture's gone that way, and it measures value in terms of money. Now, I would think, from what I've learned about you lot already, that, that you would seriously question whether that was the whole story. I certainly hope so. <laughs> I don't even think it's the start of the story. I've always regarded money as a constraint and not as anything else. In other words, you can't do it if you don't have the money. Or you can't stay in business unless, unless you are meeting your costs. Uh, these are essentially constraints. And the, the image of the businessman as, as trying to make a lot of money is, is really quite false in my experience. I was in business for a very long time. And, and people in business are essentially having fun. And they're stuck with this constraint that the balance sheet better work or they're not going to have much fun much longer. They'll be in jail or somewhere, dumped off a boat into the sea. <laughs> he was a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we're going to look at system, we have to find some kind of way of talking about it, and we're going to have to find some way of measuring it, and that's what I, I mainly want to talk with you about right now. Now, how do you recognize it? 
It's all very well. It's, it sort of looks obvious. For instance, I know the man who was appointed chairman of, of Villa Rail, chairman of the board of Villa Rail, which is the, well, was the nationalized railways of Canada. So that looks like a system, okay. How are you going to define the railways of Canada as a system? Well, what would you think of first? <laughs> <laughs> it looks well defined. Why does it look well defined? What have you got out there? Oh, so much tracks. Yeah, tracks. Go on. It's not, there's no trap here. Tracks, stations, trains on the tracks. Hmm? Okay, so looks good, doesn't it? That's the system. You've just been appointed chairman. Now, what you discover is, and this is true, uh, you don't own any of that. That's owned by somebody else. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> you have to, you have to rent all that from the guy who owns it. How, how did we ever get into that kind of fiasco? Well, British Rail is showing us the way in a big, big... <laughs> so, so, so you begin to say, well, what is a railway, see? If I don't even own all this hardware, what is it actually about? Well, what is it actually about? Someone help me with this. Getting from one place to another. Which place, Jane? You're on the you're on the track. <laughs> right. All right. You did it. No. You'd like to. Yes. Right. So there's a station in both of these cities. Yes. A long time, I can tell you. <laughs> That's not the point. That, that, what I'm interested in is, um, do you live in a railway station? And, and, and the people you're going to visit, do they live in the railway station, you see? So what is all this about the two stations, you see? What are you actually trying to do, Jane? I'm trying to cover a back distance and how, well, I could walk it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't try it if I did. I think the distance is a, a red herring, yeah. I mean, supposing you wanted to go from Victoria to, to Dorking, you see? You, know, you can't do that, can you? You're on the wrong bloody line. Typical. Um, forget the distance. What I'm saying is you're not living in the two stations. Hmm? So where, what are you actually trying to do? Yes, I mean, you, where do you live? See, you live in a house, so how far is it from the station? Call him a mile, you're lucky. <laughs> and you're going somewhere which isn't the station. So, so you see, as soon as you start thinking about the real sy systemic character of this, you are trying to sell tickets to people who want to go from A to B, and nothing of that is anything to do with a railway. Except that, at some point between A and B, there may be a chunk of railway that you can use. Well, if you were volunteering to walk just now, Jane, and the best of Canadian luck, I can tell you. <laughs> if you want to take the train, you're going to have to get to the station. You're going to have to get transport at the other end. Now, that's what I mean by a system. Mm -hmm. That you are looking at the, the operational reality of what you're trying to do, and not what somebody says to you is, oh, there's the railway. Now, they, they, managers never do this, you see. And, and when I tried to tell this to the chairman of uh, Via Rail, he was astonished. And, and uh, he said, well, where does that get us? And I said, well, you need to address the, the problems of people who are going from this house to that house, and not people who are trying to get from one railway station to another where nobody lives. Now, if you start doing that, where do you, where do you go, you see? I mean, would, would you like to, to offer the, the passenger that he will be picked up at his house in a taxi or a helicopter or something? And, you know, we will get you from your house to her house, because that's where you want to go. 
Now that's the total system, isn't it? And what I'm arguing is that we are always dealing with little bits of what is the relevant system because it's convenient. And it's convenient to measure it in terms of money. Now I'm much more concerned about comfort than money, personally. Um, I've got this pain up here. Um, I'm sitting in a comfortable chair and that matters to me. Much more than the fare, I would prefer a comfortable seat. British Rail has abandoned all that, as you must have noticed. <laughs> so, so what we have to do, is, uh, what I'm saying is we have to loosen up our notions of what a system might be and look at the reality, look at the operational reality. Now, you see, the next problem about this system is that because of reductionism, which you know, we're now used to that concept, we have a very odd idea of cause. Because cause in our culture follows what is known technically as a linear system. Now, linear is a line, okay. Now, what do I mean by this? It means that something here and then something else and so on. Yeah. It's a linear system. Real life isn't, you see. Real life isn't. There's, everything else is going on. I'll give you an example of it. Uh, well, you give me an example of a linear system <coughs> as, as normally conceived. See, it's likely to be mechanical. Think on those terms. You get in a car. What do you do? <laughs> well, you do. You've got to start it first, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. <laughs> God, I would pick on you, wouldn't I? <laughs> Think of getting in the car. You put in the clutch, perhaps, before you put it into gear. Not a bad idea. Um, you've got to put the ignition on. You've got to press the start. Eh? You've got to release the brake. Look in the rear view mirror, I believe, and so on is the popular idea. And off you go. Now, that is a linear progress. But not many things are like that. You turn to social systems, you're going to find it hard to find anything that works like that. But people insist that it does, because that's what they know how to describe, and that's what they know how to measure. And so you get all sorts of nonsense coming out about the criminal justice system is a very good case, education is a very good case, all being treated as if it were linear when it ain't, and all being measured by money, which has nothing to do with it, except that it's a constraint. How about that, as a punchy argument? You go with this? Good. <laughs> I will give you an example of a linear system in society, in the social context. I mean, it so obviously works in the mechanical context, like starting the car. It doesn't in the social context, but I'll give you an example where it did. This is a true story. In the in middle America somewhere, where, where's my nice American? No, you're gone. <laughs> okay, you're not. <laughs> somewhere in middle America, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the place, but it is a true story. They were very proud of having a local symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. So they appointed a new conductor. So he had his first concert, and the whole township turned out. You know, a big deal. So he selected the 1812 Overture. And why not? <laughs> it, it, it hit these guys. <laughs> and he's up to date. So he decided to have all the cannons. You, you all know the 1812 Overture, don't you, for goodness sake. So he had all the cannons and he lined up the, the local professor of electronics and said, I want these cannons programmed to go off at these points in the score. Beautiful idea. Harnessing technology and art. Nice. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> it didn't work. He it worked in rehearsal, but here we are. Now, we've got all the bigwids out in the finery. The first official concert, opening with the 1812 Overture. The conductor has, has a, a, a button to press to set the program going for firing these cannons in order. Now, so my linear system begins when he presses the button. 
Now, what happened then, I don't know, <laughs> the internal part of it, but they all went off at once. Whole bloody lot. Yeah. Bang! <laughs> all the lights went out, not surprisingly. <laughs> Fused. So this is a linear system. Now, what happens? These are real cannons. The whole place fills with smoke. So you've got all these bigwigs sitting there going, <laughs> can't see, can't breathe. What the hell's happened? Yeah. Next thing that happened was, modern America, good system, system. <laughs> smoke gets to the smoke things. Water pulls down on all these poor devils. <laughs> They're still doing this and, you see. That sets off automatically, this being a linear system, um, an alarm in the uh, fire brigade office. The fire brigade turn out to the opera house and they, by accident, uh, are trying out, this is true, they were trying out new equipment, which they hadn't used before. And they, they hadn't mastered it and they were all wearing this sort of space age stuff. And all the masks fell, fogged up and they couldn't see anything. So now they pull hoses all over these. Just imagine being on the receiving end of this. I think it's cripplingly funny. I'm glad I wasn't there. Now that, you see, that is a linear system. I mean, everything triggers the next action. And that's okay. Now, let's look at real life. Here you are you personally, and you're okay now. Now, let's suppose, God forbid, that you do something silly. Get sloshed or something. So, here's the linear system. I am okay. Bunk. I've done something silly. Bunk. I feel lousy. What's the next thing? You must have done this. Come on, it's the real world out there. <laughs> well, you, you can't go to bed. Take two tablets, how's that? Right? So you take two tablets, and the next box says, I'm not even going to bother writing this down. The next box says, I'm feeling better. And the next box says, I'm okay. Now, there's your linear system. Now, what, is this con what does this conceal? Hmm? How do you know about these tablets? Maybe you went to your GP. Now, think of that. Str uh, I'm very deliberately not drawing this out in detail. We, we got the linear system. Here you are feeling lousy. You go to the GP. You're up here now. You come back with the tablets. Or you've done it before. And you know what the tablets are supposed to be. So, now we've got... We've got the GP involved in this. Um, then we've got the feedback, uh, which I mentioned earlier, from where you feel okay is supposed to go back and say, don't do anything as silly as this again. <laughs> but that doesn't work altogether well, does it? <laughs> so that means that this feedback circuit has various kinds of filters and self-confusions and stuff on it. So that's going to be complicated. Then where the hell has the GP got any information about these tablets from? There is a whole pharmaceutical industry up here somewhere. I mean, try and imagine the system I'm drawing. We started with this simple line. We're right up here now. The whole pharmaceutical industry is at it. Feeding the GP at enormous expense. I hope you've taken that in. What, what they spend in trying to seduce general practitioners is just unbelievable in order that you will hear about these particular tablets. But if the GP doesn't work, you're going to get it through advertising. So this loop comes out here from the pharmaceutical industry through advertising to television telling you that you've got a particular kind of headache, which means that you have to have a particular kind of tablet. And this, this whole thing about analgesics is totally fascinating me. You know, I, I, I take this for this kind of headache and this for this kind of headache. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And so all this goes on. Um, the cybernetic research into what you do if you have a headache produced a very simple answer. Do you know what it is? Well, have a guess. 
Don't drink. Don't drink would be a very good one, but let's suppose you've done it. Too late. <laughs> what you do is stop what you're doing. I mean, I mean, I've made a joke about the drinking, but people get headaches for all sorts of stress-related uh, reasons, and you get these bogus brain diagrams with arrows going up here. <laughs> you stop what you're doing is just as good as taking a tablet, because the the pain is a, a direct result of what you're doing, and if you stop it, it'll go away. Unless you're, unless you're, you know, some pathological state, it, it works perfectly well. I haven't taken a, an analgesic pill for 40 years. If I, if I get some discomfort, I stop. So I mean, this is, I mean, this is the way that social systems build. Is what I'm, what I'm saying to you. Now, now you take the girlfriend or the boyfriend, depending on your sex or not, as the case may be. <laughs> Somebody got that one. Uh, <clears throat> who says, "Why do you do this? You know, I care for you. Don't do this. You know, stop it." Now, this is a learning loop down here which is a social learning loop and has a lot of pressure on that one. So you've got all this pharmaceutical and advertising stuff up here and now all this social pressure down here you're supposed to learn. And up at this end of the diagram you say, well, I'm feeling better and now I feel fine. And the girl boyfriend says, you're feeling fine now, but you have forgotten what a mess you were last night. I wasn't a mess last night. Anybody ever heard that? <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> no, 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 you, you're imagining it. <laughs> so you've got an oscillating loop going on here, which is a sort of learning loop which doesn't work, which is dysfunctional. While people argue with each other, and I have drawn all this out, and I'll give it to you if you really want it, but I'd prefer to wave my arms about and try and carry you with me. Out of this linear system, you see, you've got unimaginable complexity. And if you try and treat it as a simple linear system, you're sunk. But all our managers and all our ministers try and treat it as a simple linear system. The whole penology system is like that. You are naughty boy, go to jail, you know, <laughs> etc. And, and it all follows. And the causes, do you want to use the word cause? After what I've just said, I would advise against it, frankly. Now, the English philosopher, English? Maybe he was Scottish. David Hume? Scottish. Thank you. Who said that? Me. No, you. Okay, I, I was just in time, wasn't I? He, he blew the notion of cause out of the water. And you see, the, the notion of cause that we have, I really want you to think about that because it's very simplistic and it's based on the linear system. So if you've got a linear model clearly in mind, you say this has caused this, smoking, lung cancer. And that totally ignores all the rest of this going on. And the obvious fact that people smoke for various reasons, and maybe it's the various reasons that are giving them lung cancer and not the smoke, it's, it's very confused in short. Now, as soon as you can make it simplistic and, and then underwrite it, and the Americans write on their cigarette packets, uh, the Surgeon General has determined, it's an interesting word, that, you see, smoking harms you and so on. I've never been at all happy with these arguments. Now, you can certainly argue overall, it'd probably be better if we didn't smoke, but the reasons given are bogus. They, they are false. They are absolutely scientifically wrong because all these connections are attributes which don't, can't be underwritten as, as scientific phenomena. They, they are the most probabilistic in character. Now, I, I, find, this, uh, I find this more and more amazing. I, I, I've set you the task of looking at newspapers and you could try that out tomorrow on this part of the argument I mean what are people treating as systems what are they treating as causes which is totally unjustified by a really thoughtful look at these things now the most obvious example in penology is to say 
that there is a wickedness. This is a very favorite Tory argument, that people are wicked and have to be beaten. Uh, whereas the social phenomena that create all this are just disregarded, as, as you all know. I mean, this is becoming a national scandal, I think, in, in uh, this country. That the things you could do that would, would have an impact on crime, uh, you don't do. And, and you try and deal with it somewhere up here in the system when it's all far too late. And oh, after all, you can demonstrate this. Huh? We, we have more people in jail than anywhere else in the civilized world in this country, and much good does it do us. So, don't look at systems as linear. Don't look at the transfer functions, if I can get a bit more elaborate. You go from this box to this box, what happens here is, is mathematically a transfer function. This is an input to that. And the transference has some kind of characteristics, which is mathematically a transfer function. You can't measure those things, so you make them up. And you say, obviously. Mm -hmm. Now, look here. Uh, I saw some statistics recently which said that don't drink and drive. Listen. 25% of the people involved in accidents have had too much alcohol. So there. How do you like this argument? 75% of the people involved in accidents hadn't been drinking. Don't you think it's about time you started? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, this is absurd. <laughs> Please don't go away and say this chap wants us all to get sloshed and kill ourselves. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to show you that the way we, way we talk about systems is lunatic. It's just so simplistic. And this is why we need the cybernetic insights. And we, try, we want to train ourselves to look at the total system. Um... I remember a, a chairman of a very big company complaining to me when I was consulting to his company. Trouble with you, Stafford, is that if, if I ask you a question, you want to go down a gold mine and find out where the money's coming from at source. And there was something in this. <laughs> but, but unless you do that, see, and all my successful consulting has been to do with things that the, the person asking me the question hadn't even considered because they are reverberations of, of this complex system. I've made a career out of it. Now, increasingly, because of the emphasis on money, people are saying, before you hire a consultant, you must know what he's going to do and that he's going to produce these results. That is a linear concept. I wouldn't take a job. Now, I, I can show you a whole lot of government re regulations, particularly in Canada, where they're, they're very anxious. The Auditor General is anxious to, to conserve, you know, to be highlight probity in, in government affairs. A and I said, I, I wrote to him and I said, look, there are 20 things that I have to fulfill to be a consultant. Pick any one of them. Any one of the 20, and I will show you why that stops me giving you an answer. What are you going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. What are you going to investigate? I don't know what I'm going to investigate. What methods will you use? I have no idea what methods I'll use. You see, because, because until you get into it. Now, all my, all my most interesting assignments, and I... I've wondered a lot about this week how much of that I could go, go into. I mean, I, for instance, I worked a lot for the, um, for the native Indians in Canada who are faced with this kind of systemic dilemma that everybody says, OK, we're guilty of genocide, which isn't a very good start because people are terribly guilty. And the same in the United States, as you know, Catherine. Uh, <coughs> so, so we've got to put government money into it. Now, government money, what are you going to do with this government money, you wretched Indians, you see? I mean, the tone changes immediately. 
Uh, what do you want us to do with the money? Well, you've got to be self-sufficient. Look after your Indian heritage. Be self-sufficient. Fine. Why aren't you guys assimilating into Canadian society? <laughs> oh, because we are just looking after our heritage. No, your citizens of Canada join in. Now, there's a total, a absolutely total split in the systems analysis of this thing. And I went and tried to persuade my clients who were the in Ottawa, the, the uh, federal government's uh, Department of Indian Affairs of all this. It was absolutely bizarre. And I said, look, you, are, you have got the whole of the press up against you uh, because of this dilemma and you haven't even seen it. And you are spending all this money and no, the citizen can't see any result. Why is this? Here is your balance sheet published. What percentage of this enormous amount of money do you think is spent on administration? Have a guess. Pardon? Close, 85. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. So, so my appeal to you, what I'm trying to show you is you, you move into a situation not with the accepted reductionist view of it, but actually looking at what's happening. That's good science. And now we come to the question of measurement. What the hell are you going to measure if it isn't money? Now that is a really big problem. It's not just money, of course. We measure... I was trying to get this answer out of you earlier and I didn't succeed. We, it's a fairly sophisticated uh, answer, really, that I want and I'll just produce it. We measure what it is convenient to measure. So you've got people going through a tunnel, you can count them. So we measure that. It's not a question of whether it measures any use. So the whole of the census says, well, we can measure that, so we do it. Now what we really need to measure, if systems are much more complicated than we think they are, is obviously something quite different, isn't it? So what? Well, yes, but you've got to... Who's deciding? As you see, becomes the whole thing, doesn't it? Now, what I've been trying to, to suggest to you, Dave, is that systems are subjective phenomena. They are not given in nature. They're whatever you say they are. And if you want to be the chairman of a railway company who sees the stations, and if you want to be the chairman who sees blogs getting from A to B, where there are no stations, it's a very different perception. Now, we do live in a world of perception, and let us please take due note of that. We, we're very fond of thinking that there's a reality out there, and I'm on thin philosophical ice now. After all, what we have about the world is a model of the world, isn't it? It's coming to us through our senses. You know very well that the bandwidth of the visual spectrum is quite narrow. There are all sorts of uh, uh, wavelengths that we don't know anything about. And some of them give us skin cancer we're just discovering, you see. Um, we work within this narrow band with hearing we can't hear what a dog hears. We, we're stuck at about 20,000 cycles and a, a dog can hear 40. Well, then this world must be really very different. And who says which is the real world, you know? And I think it behoves us very much to look at our senses and think about what, what we can possibly understand because leaving out mysticism for the moment, which I won't leave out in the end. But if you just look at yourself as, as the natural human piece of machinery that we call a person, you've got to look at the available information that you are getting that builds the model of reality. Limited vision, limited sound, very limited touch, even worse, 
olfactory. The, the, the smell uh, sense is very, very limited. Smell and taste are united, very, very close, very, very small range. <laughs> so what is it like out there? We've really no idea. And, and we go to the stake for saying what we, what we think and what we believe, and it's really a belief system we're talking about. Now, if you're prepared to break that up, I mean, just think of the impact of this on your social beliefs and, and ultimately, of course, political beliefs or social beliefs. If, if, if you see the world like that, then all sorts of things follow. And if you, if you can't open it up and say, well, maybe it isn't like that, maybe it's just my model. After all, if you had in front of your face a red, a red piece of glass, you would go to the stake for saying that the universe is basically red. And, and we all know, we say, get rid of that piece of glass, man, for God's sake, and you see it isn't, you know. Now, all of you have seen the, uh, the, the very amusing things that can be done with, uh, for instance, optical illusions, or even much more complicated magicians on the stage doing quite incredible things. You can't work out how the hell they've done it. Our perception of the world is this bad, and if, if we want to get into the question of how to manage things better, we have to open the prospect of looking at things in a completely different way, which is very, very difficult to do. So let us get to the, the notion of uh, measurement. I've tried to break up the idea of the system. We're prepared now, I hope, to go and look at things and say, well, what the hell is going on here with as little filtration as we can. But when we get to measuring, we are in problems. Now, I've already said that we measure what's convenient to measure, whereas probably we want to measure something quite different. And if I say to one of my clients, I've done this all my life, we ought to measure this, he says, well, we, we can't. Stop. Now, uh, give you an instance of that. Um, I told you I worked in steel all that time, 13 years as a matter of fact. And a steel works is a very linear sort of place on the face of it because you shove iron ore into a blast furnace and you get out hot iron and then you send that to a steel furnace and then it comes out of there and you make an ingot and then you roll the ingot and it's, it's very linear. But uh, where I was production controller was two miles long. And what's going on around that linearity is anybody's business. You see, you've got a village there and you've got all sorts of pressures from unions, from uh, 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 um, we had a wonderful example, I mean, this is, this is the early 50s, long before feminism as such, in quotes, became an issue. Of, of what did the women in that village do? And they, they worked in the umbrella department. And, and the umbrella department was run at a loss in order to employ the women. Now, you, you come along and say, this department is running at a loss, I am an accountant. You shut it down, and then you find you've got a total social disaster on your hands because you're looking at the wrong thing. Now, what I was going to tell you was, I realized quite early on in this uh, steel career that all these departments on the linear system were being looked at separately and measured separately. And there were a lot of interactions of the kind I was doing with the pharmaceuticals and so on going on that nobody was recognizing. And I thought, well, what I need to do is measure all these things simultaneously. Now, I built a machine which would measure things to a fifth of a second, which in no, I mean, they know seconds nowadays, you know, a fifth of a second looks really dead crummy, but compared with two shifts, it's quite short. <laughs> so I said to the management, look, I'm, I'm going to measure everything simultaneously, and then we can see what the benefits of synergy are see, by, by programming things together instead of little bits. You see, if you program things in bits, you create inter-process stocks, and you tie up capital, and, and then all sorts of 
peculiar things happen because you can't find it and you've got a huge problem of bureaucracy and it's all very, very difficult. Mostly unnecessary is what I was arguing, you see, so how do you do this? So the management said to me, you want to measure things to a fifth of a second. Last time we tried work study here and the whole place went on strike. You cause a strike, young bear, and you're out. See? Mm. Oh, dear. So, in the, uh, I was a senior manager after all, young as I may have been. I, I got hold of the union people and I said, look, I'm not part of the managerial outlook on this thing. I'm, I'm trying to investigate the real world in which you guys actually work. It's obvious, isn't it? And they knew it was obvious, the managers didn't, that, that there are all these interactions. And they said, yeah, it's obvious. And I said, well, if we can measure everything simultaneously, then we could optimize this thing. And my calculations are, fellows, that we could increase productivity by a third. I mean, it's not two percent or something, a third. And they said, bloody hell, do you really think that? And I said, yes. And I, I said, let's do it. And they said, well, we shall be victimized, you know. And I said, no, I'm, we'll, we'll set this up so you aren't victimized. How do we do that? So we started a huge discussion. It was very interesting as a piece of social phenomena. This is the fifth, early 50s, you know. And this sort of thing wasn't done at all. So I put these machines out, and they were on punch paper tape that would create a... Um, a record to a fifth of a second simultaneously throughout the plant. So I said, well, right, a lot of this input is automatic because we can, we can siphon information off the load on a rolling mill, for instance, by a strain gauge, and we can use PE cells and all of that. But a lot of it has to be put in by hand. So here is a little keyboard we, we designed, and you punch that. Now, all the people using this equipment are going to be union people. Point one. The management said to me, you can't do that. We have, we have our own engineers. You can't have the unions messing around with this. I said, why not? They know what it's all about. Secondly, the punch paper tape, the union said to me, you, you're a naive young gentleman you are, you see. <laughs> not quite the language they use in Yorkshire. I'm, I'm transcribing it for your benefit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm carried away. I'm a Yorkshire accent, reverberating. You, uh, you will have all these records. And then the management, you see, can analyze that and we'll all be crucified. I said, no, you will, when we've done the work, we'll do the work together. You take the tapes and have a ceremonial bonfire. So we did all this. We got a third increase in productivity. The management tried to get me sacked because I had abandoned the managerial prerogative by letting them burn the data. Now, something's wrong here, you see, isn't it? So th this was my introduction to systems. I'm trying to make it clear to you that there is a real hard edge to all this stuff. I'm not just talking philosophy to you. I was going to be so careful about time, and I didn't, I wasn't. How, how long have we been going? Can somebody tell me? Uh, oh, we've done that, have we? Well, uh, that's a natural break in that case, because I have disturbed you with a bit of luck <laughs> about the nature of the systems and what we need to look at. I want to turn now to how you can possibly measure this mishmash. And that's a perfect break, and let's resume that after dinner, if that's okay with you. Are you still with me? Not tired out or anything? Go and brood on this. Now, I will make this formal this time. Let's start the next session with anything you want to ask me. To, you know, if you, you find all this is suddenly meaningless, and I'll go. <laughs> ask me anything you like at the start of the next session, and then we'll go on specifically to this key issue of, of how you measure it. Nobody has suggested what you might measure. You notice, notice that? You might brood about that.
There is a single answer I'm going to give you after dinner as to what you measure. I bet nobody can guess. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>